Okay, hello everyone. My name is Brianna Barner. I am a PhD student in the RTF department here at RTF. I am also um, a CWGS um, portfolio student and I also am an alum. I received my MA from uh, in the department in 2016. So I'm very excited to be back um, doing this presentation. Um, so today my presentation is called Black Joy Headquarters, Reimagining Black Feminist Worlds Through Podcasts. So I'm really excited to talk to you all about podcasts. Um, this research comes from my dissertation, so I'm super excited to talk to you all about it. So before I uh, kind of dive into my work, I wanted to give just a really brief background into podcasting, um, and then I'll connect it to uh, my work later on. Um, so podcasts are a platform that has been around now for over a decade. Um, it initially began like in the early 2000s, but it looked completely different then than it does now. So now we can listen on our phones. We could not do that back then. You had to physically download um, the episode onto your computer to listen offline. And it was really difficult to do if you didn't have like a computer or a laptop to do that. So it wasn't really something that you could listen to on the go. Like you wouldn't really be able to listen to it in your car unless you had like an iPod. So it was just a lot more complicated to listen to them um, as opposed to the way that we listen now, which meant that it wasn't as popular as it is now. And so um, that changed in 2012 when Apple uh, released an, a podcast app. And so back then, I think that it was in the iTunes store. Now it's just called, like the app is called podcast, but it was different when it first came out, but that made it more accessible so people could listen on their phones and it was easier to record podcasts and to release them out into the world. So it became more popular, it gained more steam. And so um, podcasting really took off in 2014 with uh, NPR's podcast Serial. Serial broke all kinds of records. Like it had millions of downloads within two months of debuting. So it was super huge, um, really, really big. And then from there, podcasting has just taken off. And so people have said that we are in a podcasting renaissance. Um, and I'm sure that with COVID that has like substantially increased. Um, so after Serial's success, there were more, uh, more podcasts debuted and just podcasting, sorry, podcasting took off. And so smartphones also became more advanced, which made it easier to listen to them. And so it's been completely taken off over the last few years. And one of the things that um, is interesting to note about podcasting history is that a lot of times serial is the starting point for how people describe the podcasting renaissance. But there were lots of podcasts that were created before Serial. Serial, of course, was the one that had like the biggest boom, but there were others, including podcasts created by Black people, but that history is uh, routinely left out. And so that's why I kind of wanted to give that background to set up why um, it's important to talk about um, Black podcasting and Black women specifically in podcasting. So as I stated before, um, there are racial biases in the ways that technology use is discussed um, in terms of who was considered an early adopter, who was considered like technology experts and things like that. And so in those discussions, Black people are usually left out, even though it's untrue and Black people have been using technology and have been early adopters of pretty much every platform that has come out. And so scholars have talked about the ways that Black people have used digital platforms. Black people and other marginalized groups have used um, digital platforms in very interesting ways um, and in very culturally specific ways because it's a way to bypass gatekeeping of traditional media forms to break into um, platforms like Twitter, et cetera, to use in ways that mainstream media has kind of like excluded marginalized groups from. Um, and so I'm sure that you all are familiar with Black Twitter. Uh, Black Twitter kind of uh, initially sprung about from someone observing the way that Black people use Twitter. And this was in like, I think it was like 2010s or like early 2000s. And so um, it was kind of like a surprise, like, oh, I didn't know that Black people use Twitter. That's also the say a lot of uh, the refrains that came from the beginning of podcasting. I didn't know Black people listen to podcasts. Again, both of those are not true, but from there, from like the surprise of, oh, Black people use technology, um, other scholars have taken that in turn to see, let's look at how they're using it and the different ways. And so um, I included this uh, meme um, for a number of reasons. So there's this meme is layered and I'll briefly explain it. So I'm pretty sure that we all are familiar with like, hey, if I have um, like a Netflix account and I don't wanna pay for it, 
that, you know, I'm not advocating this, but that you might use like different email addresses to get uh, free trials or whatever. So that's like the surface level of this um, meme. And then beyond that, the person whose picture here is Ray J, who is a singer. And so this, uh, these different scenes come from love and hip hop. And so this is not necessarily explained in the meme. You would have to have a cultural reference to understand like the different layers for the meme. And so I think that that's one of the ways that black people using digital technology, those are some of the things that are being described that it's used to build community. It's used to amplify marginalized voices. And it's used to also kind of create like a community of if you understand, if you know, you get it. And then if you don't, you don't. So I'll take that again to kind of zoom in further to talk about um, black feminist podcasting. So um, again, my research, I'm interested in Black feminist podcasting. Um, and so for me, I'm identifying Black feminist podcasts as one, those that have identified explicitly as Black feminists. So whether the hosts have identified as Black feminists or they have Black feminist content, but also to like um, not all of the podcasts that, I, that I'm um, addressing in my dissertation explicitly identify as Black feminists, but they have like Black feminist ideals that they are talking about. So whether that's centering Black women and other marginalized groups, um, really prioritizing um, lived, lived experiences as a, as a form of knowledge, like different ideals that align with Black feminism, those are some of the things that I'm looking to get to identify the Black feminist podcast that I'm studying. Um, and so another layer of my research is that I am an avid podcast listener. I'm obsessed with them. And so I take my experience as a podcast listener um, to really uh, form the ways that I'm um, approaching my analysis. So I'm familiar with the podcast that I'm analyzing, but then I'm also taking it a step further to think through what does it mean for me as a Black woman to listen to other Black women and other marginalized groups and how does it feel to listen to them, to hear what they have to say, but also to hear their voices, to hear hear the vernacular being used, to hear the inside jokes, the culture references, et cetera. Um, I know that in several of the podcasts I listen to, for instance, there might be like pauses or like a girl or stuff like that. And so those are really important things that signal to me, these are my people, like these sound like my friends, these sound like people in my family. And so those kinds of markers are important to note because I think that they are what make um, podcasts like these stand out and it's important to note the way that those signal to the different communities that the that the groups are trying to center um, in their in their podcasts. So for this particular um, research, this is from um, a chapter in my dissertation. Um, and so I'll I'm looking at the Black Joy mixtape. Um, and so the Black Joy mixtape is a podcast. It doesn't exist anymore unfortunately. It's one of my absolute favorite podcasts. Um, and it, de it debuted in 2016 and it lasted from 2016 to 2018. And so it's hosted by Amber J. Phillips and Jasmine Walker. And so you can see them right here. Um, and so it's a political and cultural uh, commentary podcast and it was absolutely incredible. I was obsessed with it. It was an amazing podcast. And so each week, well, they didn't always uh, produce an episode each week, but each episode I should say, um, is a model after a mixtape. So obviously it's called the Black Joy Mixtape. And so it's modeled after like the mixtape where um, each episode is called a track instead of an episode. As you can see from the cover art, it looks like a CD or a mixtape. Um, it has the parental advisory label on here. And so um, they are aligning themselves, I think, by calling themselves a mixtape. They're aligning with a specific kind of audience where it's like, hey, we're trying to reach um, you know, our, we're trying to reach our people, we are trying to bring really dense information in terms of like analyzing podcasts to a much larger group and in a way that hasn't been presented before. And so, for instance, they might um, compare something with trap music to something that has happened in the Supreme Court or just any kind of thing. Like they try to take really heavy information and size it down so that um, it's a lot more digestible and understandable by different groups which is one of the reasons why I, I loved it and I, I missed it a lot. If you haven't listened to it, I would highly recommend you listen to it. So these uh, this podcast, they identify as Black feminists. Um, they sold merchandise that said Petty Black Feminists. And so like they are an explicit Black feminist podcast. And so this is an example of they identify as Black feminists. Their first episode of the podcast was called The Birth of a Black Feminist. So this is a very explicit Black feminist podcast. 
So I first discovered um, this podcast. I have a really long commute. And so I got tired of listening to music on my way home. But beyond that, I also just felt like really lonely and isolated. Um, at the time, I was the only Black person in my cohort. And so um, I just wanted to hear voices that sounded like mine. I wanted to hear people who sounded like me. And so I discovered this podcast and other podcasts um, and it was just completely impressed with how they sounded. Like they sounded like my friends and it was really refreshing to hear that. So um, in the um, on this page, um, I wanted to put just really quickly a quote that Amber said on her Twitter. I had to find my voice. I'm a black girl from Columbus, Ohio, and I talk a certain way, a certain kind of way. And we need more people who sound like me talking politics. And so I think that that's an important part of um, of their activism. It's like they they both have very uh, heavy accents. Jasmine is from Mississippi. Amber is from the Midwest. And so they bring that as part of their identity as hosts and as cultural commentators. And so I think that that also is what is a draw of the podcast, that they sound familiar and they just sound like someone that we all would know. And so um, those are one of the things that I wanted to highlight about why I was drawn to do this work. So um, in my uh, chapter, I'm analyzing three episodes. Um, one of them is an abortion story. So one of their friends comes over um, to uh, hear, um, to, to receive her earrings. And then she ends up getting on the microphone and telling the story about her abortion. Um, the next episode is um, Jasmine, one of the hosts, talking about her sexual assault and um, how she is including herself in the Me Too movement and talking about the different ways that her assault has impacted her. And then lastly, um, is the episode is called I'm Worthy and it's talking about um, a brunch that was held in DC. I'm not sure if it still happens, but it's a brunch that um, centers Black Femmes and um, is, a, is a space for specifically for uh, Black Femmes. And so um, in the in the episode, um, the founders of the brunch talked to Jasmine and Amber about the uh, event and how they started it and things like that. So um, one of the things that I um, highlight in my dissertation is how um, in the in the in the podcast they talk about the Black Joy headquarters, which is where they record their podcast, which is just Amber's living room. But um, I think that the idea of them recording their podcast in the living room is really important because it sounds gritty. It doesn't sound polished like it would if they were in a studio. And so I think it's important to note that that it doesn't sound polished. It doesn't sound um, like they're in a studio. And to me, that really uh, amplifies the intimacy of the podcast because it shows that they are in a space of comfort, a space that is sacred, that's intimate. And it sounds like it. It sounds like something that would be recorded in my living room or my friend's living room. And I think that that highlights the ways that they make it accessible, but they also, it's just, it's a regular conversation between two friends. And it's like, we're sitting in on a very intimate and sacred um, conversation. And so I think that like, so on the one hand, they talk about like, oh, you know, we don't sound professional. We're in the living room crowding around one mic. But I think that that's really significant because it doesn't have to sound polished. And I think that it makes a difference because sometimes they were able to have studio time and when they would be in the studio, it wouldn't be the same. Like it wouldn't be the same dynamic. They would sound like they were less comfortable because they were in a studio as opposed to Amber's living room. And so I think that that makes a huge difference as the space that they're in and how that has made a difference in their level of comfort and the way that they sound. And I think that the living room as sacred space is important too because you know, living room spaces and homes are where you entertain. It's where you might have your friends over and they're replicating this space in the podcast. And so also in the podcast, um, they, in the episodes I analyzed, they reimagine new worlds. And so they are taking different um, things that are happening and they're kind of reimagining it through a black feminist lens. So for instance, when one of their friends is talking about her abortion story, she, um, Amber, one of the co-hosts says, oh, you know, like she talks about how the, their friend talks about how she wasn't able to choose her provider and that made her really upset and it made her cry because she really wanted to have her procedure done by a black woman and it wasn't and so Amber is like well what would happen if like in the, at an abortion clinic um it's like a spa treatment like as we celebrate or you know like provide a service and provide dignity and 
and just allow people to have dignity during this service as opposed to the really rude and cold way that she experienced it. And so that's one way that they're imagining a world where Black women are centered and prioritized. And then another way is with the Black Femme Brunch, reimagining gender, reimagining a space so that Black Femmes can come and celebrate themselves, feel protected, not have to worry about not feeling safe and, and be at a place where they are celebrated and prioritized. So those are different ways where they reimagine new worlds and reimagine new ways of being. And then lastly, um, the safe, bold spaces. So again, the living room as a safe space, a safe space to be bold. So uh, their friend is telling her abortion story and she's sharing this really um, empowering experience that she had of like, I made this decision, this is what I wanted to do. And I'm sharing this with you all because I want to present a different narrative and a different perspective. And she's doing it in the living room with her homegirls and they're just talking as if they're having a regular conversation. So on the one hand, they're normalizing it. And then on the other hand, they're also showing like we know that this is not something that you all have heard all the time. And so this is a different kind of abortion story that you are hearing. And we are doing this intentionally to show a different way of hearing the story and not one of shame, but one of love and comfort and uplifting. So those are just some of the themes that I pulled out of those episodes and um, an example of the ways that podcasting can be a very intimate space and can replicate some of the same spaces, same social spaces that um, marginalized groups have had to build to build community and to center themselves. And so I can talk more about the rest of my research during the Q&A and I wanna thank you all for listening to my presentation. Thank you. <laughs>